What is up, THP Strength Gang? Welcome to another podcast. This is episode 39. Today we're going to be doing a Q&A. Last time we did a Q&A, it got the most listened on our podcast. So I guess you guys really like it or something. Um, so yeah, we were supposed to do this on Sunday. Didn't do it on Sunday. Then we were going to do it on Tuesday. Didn't do it on Tuesday. But it's okay, guys. Better late than never. At least you guys get a podcast. Yeah. Um, so I basically asked you guys to ask me questions on my Instagram. I specifically said no stupid questions and just doing a quick look through them. They're really good. So I guess that worked. And you guys, if you're one of my followers, you're way more educated than his followers. You probably found this podcast from my following and not hit not playing. <laughs> before, <laughs> my questions are actually usually pretty good. Before we start this, we should probably give a quick, update. Yeah, quick update. Where, where are okay. we at in life? All right. So yeah, first off, I got to say on the YouTube video, uh, I'm going to say bro as much as I want. I'm going to say all right as much as I want. I'm going to do whatever the Frick I want, all right? <laughs> so, y'all talking shit, talk shit, get hit, come out here and jump with us, you want to talk shit, no, I'm playing. <laughs> but, that's my first thing. Second thing, um, let's see, training-wise, it's bro. Blushing, bro. <laughs> it's the lighting, it's got that perfect lighting. Uh, there was some, actually, I do read all the YouTube comments, um, and it's always funny, like, YouTube is probably, like, like, the worst humans on planet Earth are in the YouTube comment section, usually. But, uh, like, like if you go through just any video and you, you look for, like, the like you can find the worst humans on the YouTube comment section. Like, just the worst. TikTok is bad, too. You just go to the comment section and you're like, this is just so offensive. Like, the things people are saying. YouTube is really like that. bad. Yeah. But, fortunately, Isaiah has, like, a pretty good, like, following. Like, a lot of people that watch it are, uh, they're, like, supporters, I guess. Yeah. And, like, they love his stuff. Um, so, yeah. I, I do read all those. One of them was really funny. There was a kid that was like, bro, I've been listening to the podcast for like weeks now. And this whole time I thought John was like a 45 year old dude. <laughs> and it made the <laughs> podcast so much funnier. And I was like, no, hell no. But that's hilarious. So if you're listening to this and you think I'm a 45 year old dude because I coach track at Duke, uh, I am not. I am a 26 year old male. <laughs> I'm like four years older than Isaiah. Uh, His so vertical is old though. Uh-huh. <laughs> 39 oh yeah that's big my vertical touched, is pretty old too yeah i i touched uh i touched 39 inches or i touched 11 2 and like bro how close was i to 11 3 was i like i think it was like, i couldn't see I feel there like was, was no like, daylight in between there was no daylight yeah. fingers and it's at least 11 2 and a half i think but um i need a, for a legit 40 my vertex only has inch increments for a legit 40 i need 11 3 um, so I'm super close and I did not even feel great on the day and I didn't even like hit the jump. So I think I'll hit that soon. So that's my updates. Isaiah, you got anything going on? Uh, still soon. trying to touch 12. <laughs> <laughs> how's your foot? Um, how's your foot? I, my foot, my posterior tibia atlas tendon is doing really well. Uh, so John's worked his magic and I'm a wizard. made a lot of progress. Quad tendon feeling really good. So overall, since I've been to North Carolina, I'm, I'm my strongest, uh, my healthiest, all that. So doing really well. Last Tuesday, I drove a long time to go see Lewis and we ended up hiking for three hours uphill. This is two days ago, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> my, two days ago, my soleus is destroyed. Like, it's never been this sore. I've never felt my calves be this sore in my life, so... I'm... And, fortunately, Ball is Life is coming to film a session. Yeah. And, honestly, <laughs> in, in terms of a performance standpoint... By the way, General, my hairline is looking crispy right now, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> my brother hit me up in the questions asking why my hairline is so yeah, bad. Yeah, that was one of the questions. So, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm from a performance standpoint, not a good decision for months, and... Yes. Mentally, he, he just he just got engaged, and they spent like their honeymoon in North Carolina. So on their last day, I went to go visit, and also to destroy my legs. <laughs> but Whatever. I'm Isaiah Rivera. I get shit done. Yeah. I'm a dunk real well. If there's, if there's anything I've learned about Isaiah, it's that no matter the condition, he'll still show out. I'm gonna show up and show out, baby. Exactly. That's what makes him <laughs> one of the best in the world. Look, I the day I learned I'm gonna show up and show out was 2017. I could barely walk. Knees were absolute just trash. Like, I was in pain, literally just thinking. I was, yeah. <laughs> that's how bad they were. I was in pain. And then the, the thing started, and I was able to dunk. Ever yeah. since that day, I'm like, all right, like, I'm just, I'm going to, I might not jump as high as I could have been jumping, but I'm going to, I'm going to do my dunks. Steven Dunks, <laughs> underscore, underscore. I believe this is Steven Shihada. Shout out, um, shout out, shout out. He asks, what goals do you guys want to achieve before 2021? Um, I'd like to go to a brewery again. No, I'm playing. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know. You go first. Do you know what yours are? I know what yours are. Yours is touch 12 feet, right? No, yeah. touch 12 three, probably. Yeah, well, I want to touch 12 three. I don't know if that's realistic before the year ends. Honestly, it could be. I think it could be. I, I think, think it could be right if, day. like, there's no events and I, like, strictly train for it. Yeah, I think you could do that. That's a 50 inch vertical, by the way. Yeah, that'd be big. a legit 50. A 50 yes. a 50 incher, as we like to call it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think for me, a big goal would be 40. I want to hit 40 legit on my left foot and I'm like so close to that uh that that's a big goal I want to continue to grow the business to where we're like perfectly sustainable with it um and make sure that the quality of that keeps going up and that our athletes keep getting better that's a big goal of mine and then obviously with high jump I want to learn as much as I can about that and keep um make sure I, I keep getting better on my right foot get my hamstring better so those are mine yeah I also have more goals but I keep them secret Secret goals. Yes. Because, oh, there's something funny about Jordan Kilgannon I should mention. I should have put this in the update. So I was messaging Jordan, and I was like, Jordan, come down and visit. And he's like, I'll murder you if I do. Or he said, if you do. Prior to this, we were talking about him coming down. I was like, I don't have to film you. And he was saying, I'll murder you if you film me. But I thought he was saying, I'll murder you if I come down there, like in all the training stuff. And I was like, oh, well, that, I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, you're a better athlete than me. Of course you'll beat me. Like, I might beat you in a couple of things. Like, I'll probably beat you in, like, lunge, maybe one foot bird, and maybe long sprints. That's all I have on you. And he was like, yeah, we just talked about it. And he's like, no, I'm going to go lunge. And he goes and freaking reverse lunges 315. Apparently, he took that as, uh, I'll mur- <laughs> what he meant was, I'll murder you if you film this. And then I, so it sounded like I was saying, come train with us, I'll murk you and all this shit. And I didn't mean that at all. I was, I was saying the opposite. So, uh, Jordan, if you're listening to this, I don't know if you do listen to it, but, uh, I apologize. I didn't, I meant, I was conceding. Uh, that was a funny news yeah. update I should have included, but you're really strong. Shout out on the lunch. That was really impressive. <laughs> all right. Second question. Uh, be rough. He asked be rough. your take on training twice a day while say the power strength phase of lifting. Um, do you have an do you have input on this? Uh, yes. I actually see a benefit in training twice per day when you do workouts like ours, where a big portion of the workout is done on the track and with running, and then another portion of the workout is dealing with strength training. Um, I always used to do it like in, in just one go, so go straight from the track to the weight room and just get it done. And ever since being here, we kind of what we do is we do the, the running first and then we come back and then we take like a like a short like 30 minutes uh 30 minute break and then we go do the weight room workout and the quality of my lifts just goes up a lot um especially if you eat something small like get some carbs in in between um so i see a big benefit when i go to florida what i'm actually gonna think about doing is like an even bigger spread like go sprint in the morning either sprint in the morning or in the late afternoon and then at noon get my lifting session in so I yeah. think it makes a big difference in the quality of your work. I agree. I think if you were to even just look at sports like football that do two or three days, um, you know, you're just really trying to get slightly more or way more volume with higher quality. So it can work really well, but you have to be super diligent. You have to be willing to uh, live a lifestyle that allows you to wake up, sprint, train, eat something, chill for a while, come back, finish the lift, finish training, you know, and your, your focus level can be you can be way more focused if you're, if you're trying to do that, you know, collegiate athletes, that's basically what they do. Um, you know, they're kind of beholding to logistics. So you come in in the morning, you go to your lift, you have a couple hours off and then you come out to the track. Um, you know, is it ideal to lift in the morning? No, but like you've had six to seven hours to kind of bounce back from that metabolically. So, you know, maybe you're a little fatigued centrally or whatever, but it's not too bad. So I think, I think it works really well if, if you can logistically, set it up to to be able to do that so shout out be rough hope your burp keeps going up people sleep on you (laughs) all right next question uh this is nathan underscore dunks underscore i have so many questions too by the way but we can i guess we go through them oh shoot yeah yeah yeah. uh he says would you like to train someone like eddie hall to dunk uh what do you i mean what do you think i think it'd be pretty fun (laughs) (laughs) honestly we're i'd say i mean i'm kind of speaking for john here but i feel like it'd be fun to train anybody like like yeah. when when i think of any athlete like i always like i would always want to like train them like doesn't really matter yeah if we're compensated it for it for sure <laughs> yes, yes that's generally how i approach it um all right so i have a bunch of questions so isometrics why are they good dunk camp one i introduced it um to two people to like yeah to like six people uh no actually i i had two people 
doing it, like the actual programming. And then I spoke about it and everyone just kind of like, I don't know. I mean, Ebony Rio popularized it, but everyone just ran with it and posted about it all the time without knowing what it was really used for. So it's kind of blown up since then, which is cool, but also annoying because people don't know why they're doing what they're doing. So they're good because they're, they have an analgesic response, meaning pain relieving response. They make the tendon more compliant. They load the central core of the tendon because tendons are viscoelastic. So the longer that you load them, uh, they get softer basically throughout that period of time. You can load centrally. You can load the, the tendon. At least that's what Keith Barr's research says. Ebony Rio, you know, has maybe some different ideas with it, but really it increases the function um, of, your, of your knee, quadricep, that whole com complex joint, whatever. So that's why they're useful. Um, they're a starting point usually, or sometimes they can be just like a band-aid, but usually they won't fix the problem as a whole. And if you jump and do isometrics, they're not going to be, it's not going to be the whole, like it's not going to work. Like people think they can just add isometrics in and they're like, oh, I'm good to go. Yeah. It doesn't really work that way. So it's that, that magic, uh, that magic secret, like mentality, like, oh, like this is the key exercise. Oh yeah. But there's. Yeah, I think a lot of people, a lot of people, like it's popularized. I feel like people see us and they're like, "Oh, they're the isometrics people, probably." But like, it's literally just the beginning of the thing. And I think people see us as that because, like, that's the starting point for everybody. Like, that's and you, and you continue to do for free. <laughs> and, and people, and you also continue doing isometrics even when you're healthy. Yeah. Um, or we add. Yeah, but it's not. It's not the end all, be all, like knee pain. Yeah, so. I agree with that. You're up. All right. When are you considering the lead dunker? <laughs> Next question. You can make it between the legs on any given day. <laughs> Wait, someone asked that? Yeah, they said, when are you considering the lead dunker? And I said, Actually, this is, I, I consider, I consider someone elite. Nathan dunks. It also depends what you consider elite. Because, like, if, if it's elite compared to the general population and, like, just dunking, like. Yeah. So, but if you take out of everybody, all the dunkers, what makes someone elite, like, what separates them from the rest. I would um I, I would further define it as elite being able to be like you can compete like yeah. you can compete in a dunk contest with the best. <laughs> I would say being able to do it between the legs on f your first try every session. If you can do it between the legs first try every session, I'd consider you elite. Yeah, that's I, I like that as a measuring. Or maybe you can hit a between the legs eight out of ten times. Yeah, on ten feet. Because Dan Gross misses it. <laughs> yeah, that's literally what I was thinking about. And Dan can do a lot of dunks. Yeah, yeah. Well. So I would say if you can do eight out of ten between the legs, first try on ten feet on any floor, also any floor. Yeah. So you can put you can put you on any hoop and you between the legs eight out of ten times. So I yeah, agree with that. I, that's that's and you're elite in my eyes. What's your question? You're thinking. How do you motivate yourself to just do it and keep doing it? So I wanted to answer this question because it's a really common question that I get. And my answer is you just literally have to like it. If you lo love something enough, you'll be motivated to do it. Like, you'll yeah. wake up and, like, be motivated to do it. For example, uh, I know John relates to this, but, like, jump research. Like, <laughs> the passion for wanting to train or, like, learn about it. Um, I remember when I first started trying to jump higher, like, I loved it so much that literally all my free time was spent researching how to jump higher. Like, like I was always on Google trying to find, like, like new, new ways to do it. Um like what other people have to say about it, like, like looking at studies, that type of thing. And I wasn't motivated from a, a fact that like I wanted to jump higher per se. I honestly just liked the knowledge that I was gaining. So yeah, just, you would just have to love it. You have to like it. If you don't, if you don't love it, if you don't like it, if you feel like you need to be motivated, like if you get up in the morning and you're like, eh, like, I don't, I don't really want to do it today. Like you probably don't like it. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, you just gotta you just gotta like like whatever you're doing. I think another way that I kind of assess that is like if I didn't have this job, would I still be doing it? And yes, the answer is yes, I would. <laughs> like yeah. in my free time, if there's something that I have I have nothing to do, I will like sit on my phone and like go through my Instagram and my Instagram is just all jump related content. Like you're not gonna see me follow fit chicks, you're not gonna see me follow stupid at home workouts or do it yourself or even yeah. my friends really on my Instagram, like my Instagram purely is training related content. Like that's why I enjoy watching. I don't really care about you holding up a supplement bottle. Like that's stupid to me. Or you taking a picture with your dog. That's, that's like shallow and stuff. I, I don't really like, that's not interesting to me at least. I or guess. Or sport. 
I shout out Artist Sport. <laughs> Stay fresh and on your grind with Artist Sport. I know that saying. They definitely don't listen to this podcast. No, they don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Imagine one day they sponsor my podcast. Yeah. Thoughts, thoughts uh, if dunkers have the capacity, should they just dunk more or plyos? Um, if you, okay, so the question is, thoughts. If dunkers have the capacity, should they just dunk more or should they do plyos? Dunking is like king. Specificity is king. If you can dunk more, I'd rather have you dunk more than be doing plyos. But again, it's so dependent. Like I would tell a kid that generally I would give that advice, but for Isaiah, no, hell no. Even if he had the capacity, I don't necessarily, we know because we've had his capacity high enough where he can dunk. I don't know. I don't know. Three days a week or something like that. Probably. Yeah. I would say, Um, I mean, my capacity is probably the highest it's ever been now. And I think plyos played a big role in raising that capacity uh, without getting hurt. Whereas if you go straight into dunking, like that's already the max. Like the, that is, as, that is the, the highest end, load activity. That is the end of the progression. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like plyos could be a progression into being able to dunk more frequently. Yeah. But even then, it's still like dunking is not. You still like, need to at practice a certain the skill. level. Yeah, you have to. You definitely need the skill of dunking. But like at a certain level, there comes a point where like dunking does not better at jumping. Like per se, like you have to. Yeah. Like, you have to do other things to... I mean, improve. not in, not talking about technique, like, because obviously... You oh, need, yeah, you need like, not technique. hands. But not including jump jumping technique, high. but purely, yeah, purely from a jumping higher aspect. Um, I would say plyos would definitely, like, be more be- beneficial for me. And you can control it a lot more. Like, if I go if I go have a dunk session, like, like nine times out of ten, it's going to end up being two hours long, and, like, I'm going to end up <laughs> losing the benefits of, like like dunking and stuff yeah from looking at it from a jumping high standpoint whereas if i go do plyos like like you're gonna manage it you're gonna do what's up what's written like there you might you might jump a few extra times but it's not gonna be like dunking where you just go off like for an extra hour yeah you kind of you're just aware of it it's more of a controlled environment so that's i mean i even struggle as a coach to control the athletes when they jump like i just I don't know, I just kind of let them do their thing because they're having fun. It's fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you're up. What question? Do you need to be a, a on a curl, curl? Or this is, by the way, this is Ricardo.ncarvalho. Do you need to be in a curl? curl oh, he spelled it wrong, so it's messing me up. Calor- he spelled it caloric. Caloric, caloric what? <laughs> caloric surplus to get stronger. Or no. is it only necessary to build muscle? No, you don't. I mean, uh, you can. I would argue you can. If you're on steroids, you can build muscle and be in a deficit. Uh, some people have the hormone profiles. I would assume that they would actually be able to increase their muscle mass while on a deficit. I actually know for a fact, I was, I had a period of time where I was decreasing fat mass and increasing muscle mass. And I don't believe I was fasting. I don't believe my caloric intake was crazy high while I was doing that. I think it, if you, if you're genetically predisposed to gain more mass than you currently have, and you're a little bit pudgier than you should be, and you train really hard for you to gain more mass and lose fat at the same time, but you really, really have to train intelligently, super hard, yeah. and probably have to have like a certain macronutrient profile to be able to to be able to do that. I think for me, I had a really high protein diet, I had a really high vegetable diet, and um, I know I was in a caloric deficit, like I'm positive, but I gained in 45 days, I gained three pounds of muscle and lost, or maybe it was, maybe it was two pounds of muscle and I lost like three pounds of fat or something like that. Yeah. I don't remember. It was, I, it was significant for sure. I think I'm, I also think I'm like very rarely in a big coral, like, coral Oh my gosh. Caloric. <laughs> I'm very rarely in a caloric, uh, surplus. I feel like, yeah, like I, don't I eat a lot know. of cereal. I am really bad about taking in protein and keep getting stronger. You get some so. more muscle mass. So yeah. I think it can occur for sure. But, yeah. uh, my question, does pelvic tilt affect vertical jump? Yeah, for sure. Um, if you're, Generally speaking, all jumpers have a slight anterior tilt when they are pushing off their penultimate step, and then they usually move to like a neutral position or even posterior pelvic position. So that's the position of the pelvis. Butt out would be anterior tilt. Posterior tilt would be like tucking your pelvis in. Uh, I'm not going to give an analogy for this, but uh, tucking your pelvis in. So yes, it does. It matters, but usually it just happens because of the way that your hips are moving. Your pelvis is going to react to the way your femurs are moving. You're probably not actively controlling your pelvis uh, consciously. Like that's nothing anyone's ever really thinking about. They're thinking about, oh, to get this foot back behind me, my pelvis will be an anterior tilt. How to heal quad tendon pain? Sign up for coaching at thbstrength.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
What or who inspired you to become a professional dunker? Michael Jordan. <laughs> uh, Jordan Kogannon is the first person that I really saw. And I saw him progress uh, from rim grazing to the, doing the crown dunk. And then I was like, wow, I can do that too. And I started doing that. So How about that? So I feel it was like what I... That's what I hope I'm doing to a lot of people now. Like, they're seeing my progress and then it's inspiring them to do the same thing. Uh, why do you chase speed jumping when plenty of people have jump power jump very high? Shout out Ryan Nagel. Um, so I like speed jumping because it's prettier. You can get more horizontal velocity to take off. Uh, it's more, if you can use it in a game, it's actually your get off and on and off the ground quicker. Like Nick Burz is a, an example of that. But uh, for high jump, I rotate backwards off my left foot. And I want to get my pelvis to be perfectly level over the bar. And the only way you can do that is by matching your forward and lateral somersault. So to do that, I need more forward somersault. Speed jumping gives you more forward somersault. Um, and then it looks, again, for dunking, it just looks sick. Like, I don't know, it looks cool. <laughs> That's why I like it. It's better for high jump, generally speaking, technically. And I pride myself on being good at everything technically outside of anything that's limited by mobility. So, yeah, that would be my answer. All right. I, I want to do two questions back to back. Um, first one's at what vert would you be a pro dunker material? Um, so I, I remember me and John were actually talking about this. What, I, I don't think you should look at it in terms of vert. You should look at it in terms of your max touch. I think to be a pro dunker, you need to be able to touch around 11, seven, 11, eight. I think that's true. Like consistently. Yeah. If you want to know what vertical you need, just subtract 11, eight from what your standing reaches and that's what vertical you would need to so i only need compete. five more inches to be no yeah five more inches to be an elite elite i'll player. take six six you haven't touched it yet you're right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> i just like to <laughs> be like oh well, 11 2 to 11 7 now oh yeah. you're saying 11 8 11 8 also there's a difference that's huge you you six to... inches is huge <laughs> there's also a difference i feel like you need to touch it consistently yeah, yeah on any I... given day basically on every jump yeah. like for me it's like i can hit it once <laughs> like, yeah. on a good day all right uh next question will will the thp strength coaching make me get an athletic body yeah 100 percent. like, like can, you, can you talk to him about um remember what remember what you said to like have body composition just train like elite and then you, you'll have good body composition oh like yeah oh yeah it's like hard uh it's really hard to not have to not like it's a prerequisite to know how to get people to lose weight to be an elite athlete. Like I think about it like this. If you're, if you're trying to get people to run the fastest in the entire world, that's the hardest thing that you could possibly do. Like getting people to go from a 10, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 whatever in the, in the, whatever, 10 point in the hundred meter dash to nine, 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 like 9.99 is insanely difficult. Like that, that point oh one improvement from 10 to sub 10 very difficult like you have to do everything perfectly as a coach you have to dial everything in you have to make sure their training's perfect diet's perfect everything is on right and then down that continuum in terms of like ease it's less hard to get someone to long jump a centimeter farther like that's still incredibly difficult to go from eight meters to 8.01 you know eight meters one centimeter that's super super difficult it's it's pos it's but it's easier than it is getting someone to point or 0 0.01 faster in the 100 meter dash when they're already a 10 second guy and then down that continuum like the less elite you are as an athlete the easier it is to get you to improve body comp is at the very bottom body comp is the easiest thing <laughs> like yeah. if you don't if you don't know how to do that well you sure as shit can't get uh you know a 10 second guy to 990 or 999 you definitely can't do that if you can't even get someone to lose weight like in terms of difficulty and, you know, and, and moving down that continuum, that is the, the easiest thing to do. So uh, a good example is Travis. Travis, Travis started working with us. <laughs> he started being mindful of what he ate. And then he just trained with us, not focused on like losing weight. Like he was literally just training for vert. And I think he, he went from like 200 pounds, to like 180. Yes. Like that. And like, like a short period of time. Yeah. And, and it's really hard to not be insanely lean when you train like an elite athlete. Like someone said this once and they're like, hey, losing weight's easy. If you want to lose weight, just train like an Olympian. Yeah, hell yeah, you'll lose weight. <laughs> like yeah. if you commit to training two to three hours a day, like hard, you're going to lose weight. When people don't lose weight, I'm like, 
either you're not training hard, your output's you're really low, or you're like eating like – you have to be eating so poorly <laughs> to not lose weight on the training. Like at 26 years old, uh, I don't – there's not a lot of 26-year-olds out there that are doing what I'm doing, that have a 39-inch vertical off one foot. I, I mean very few people out that are not elite dunkers. I've said this before, but – People that are not elite dunkers that have a 39-inch vertical, I mean, how many people can you think of that are not elite dunkers, like like world-class dunkers or competitive dunkers yeah. that have a 39-plus-inch vertical? Well, there's elite high jumpers or world-class high jumpers, basketball players. Like every pro athlete, if you're not a pro athlete and you have one foot vertical at 39-plus, there's not a lot of people that do yeah. that at 26 years old. Like I'm still and Tom able, looks like a snack. I look like a snack. So what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> well, they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. But part of the reason, like, I'm able to stay that lean is because of the training. Like I would get fat if I didn't train. People think that I'm just like lean because, oh, you're just, just your genetics. Like hell no, bro. There was a period of time I freaking drank beer and ate pizza for like, I was really upset and depressed because I hated my job and life sucked. And like, I think I gained like 20 pounds of fat and lost like 10 pounds of muscle in a solid two or three months. I tore my labrum. Like at first dunk camp one, I remember it. People saw me, and apparently I looked like a fat shit cake. The second year, people hadn't seen me for a full year. I came back and was able to train, and they were like, oh, dude, you look amazing. Like, you look so good. Isaiah says this all the time. Oh, man, I forget how athletic you look. The other days, I'm, like, training, and I'm working out. He's like, bro, you just got the perfect build. He never said that to me before. (laughs) Don't camp one. He's like, you look like a fat, flabby fat boy. (laughs) I didn't know that. At my brother's wedding, he was like, like, yeah, John, have you been working out? I was like, no, dude, I tore my labrum. Like, I've just been freaking drinking two beers a night and eating pizzas and he was like <laughs> he's like yeah i can tell and i was like damn bro it's the day of your wedding i have to go give a speech to like a thousand people like at a massive hall to <laughs> and it's like beautiful and now i feel really insecure about how fat i am uh so that all said um yeah if you do the training you'll you'll get an athletic body you'll get an athletic body <laughs> uh is it my my question yeah, yeah it's, okay it's um do a podcast on what you consider the ultimate jumper to be built like. We kind of already talked about that, so I'm going to skip that. Taking out specific things, jump and sprint, allow, and allowing effects to maintain, residual effects to maintain. Um, residual effects are really important, but generally speaking, if you take something out, you're going to get worse at it. So um, there's detraining timelines, and detraining timelines like for strength, it's like after 30 days, if you didn't do any strength work <clears throat> or sprinting or plyos, you could maintain 95% of your max strength. Like you could say you squat 100 pounds, 30 days of doing absolutely nothing, you'll squat 95 pounds 30 days later. If you did plyos, that you're going to maintain more of that, you know, more and more. And then obviously 60 days, you might get down to 80% of your max strength. So speed work is more sensitive. If you don't do speed work for a week or you don't touch running or plyos or anything that's related to sprinting, you don't do it for a week, two weeks, you're going to lose it fast and it's really hard to get back. Um, If you look at distance running, distance running is one day. If you don't run for one day, you're going to lose it. But it's easy to get back. So if you don't run for one or two days, yeah, you might feel like crap the next time you go out for a run. But after one day of running, you're going to get a lot of the fitness that you lost back. So it just kind of detraining timelines are very, very important. That's actually how I determine a lot of what I put in the training plans is, okay, well, I have to touch this stimulus on this day because we haven't touched it for this long. And I know what the detraining timelines are if I'm doing these things. And that sort of is like, I don't know, it's all in my head. I can't really like put that on paper and describe to you how the, all those things interplay. But um, yeah, the, that, that's what I generally say about residual training effects. So are you your question? Yeah, uh, I get a lot of questions about what I think about other jump programs. Like, and I'm really tired of answering that question. We're better than every jump program. All right. If you want suboptimal training, go get another another training plan. As simple as that. If you want the best training, get purchase our online coaching. If you want suboptimal training, purchase any other program. And then come back to us in three months when you realize you shouldn't have bought that other program. And you could have saved up two months of that wasted money to get our training. Yeah. And I always say this, like, if we can't get you better, no one can. I like straight up, I confidently say that. I told the Duke coach that today, the head coach at Duke for track and field. He was like, are you coming back to volunteer at Duke for high jump? And I was like, uh, I can commit to two days a week. And he's like, all right, well, you'll be fired if you don't get these two athletes to win ACCs and I was, or to NCAAs or something like that. And I was like, if I can't do it, no one can. <laughs> like, That's awesome. It's like, I like straight up believe that. I'm like, no, nah. if anyone else does it, it's pure luck. Like it's just sheer luck. It, the athlete on the day or it's the athlete is not the coach. Yeah. So I firmly, I straight up do believe that. And yeah, it might be cocky, but like 
I don't know. I just I firmly believe. How much online. time are we at? at the... uh, I think total are like twenty five minutes or something like that. So in really, total, three five minute clips and a ten minute clip should be like okay. twenty five minutes. All right, cool, cool. You're up. Uh, would you like to see more new people in the Duncan community? Hell yeah. Yeah, bigger the bigger uh, it can become, the better. I think that's actually we need, one of we like, need women to get into it. Yeah, that's one of the things I really want to see happen is just more people like be into dunking. Like, straight yeah. up. And I think the way to do it is low rimming. Wow. That's the key. That's how you can... I feel like any sport that has become big, like basketball, uh, baseball, soccer, any of that stuff, it's big because of its availability to massive amounts of people. So basketball, why do people like basketball? Because a lot of people can play basketball. Chances are, if you, like, if you watch basketball, you've probably played basketball. Who are the people that are into dunking? The people that have dunked or are trying to dunk you, or have played basketball and tried to dunk at some point <laughs> yeah but like you feel like you have the capacity to to dunk right so i think the way to get dunking uh to blow up to become bigger is literally just to have more people lower me because if you can lower him you'll see the difficulty of it you'll see how fun it is you'll be obsessed with the progress and then you'll be able to appreciate people that dunk at a high level right so People that are really into pro dunking are people that have tried to dunk and they realize how freaking hard it is. And then you see this dude come up here, stick both his elbows in the rim, like, yeah, what, like what the hell? Like that's crazy. So you want to keep watching it? You, really, like, you know how hard that's it is. like casual for me to watch at this point. By the way, people I like, I like have friends watch. I had some friends come and watch the session, and I realized how much my mindset had changed. Like I get hyped for them, and if you listen to it, I'll be like, oh boy, and stuff like that. And I'm sure Bro. you listen to me. Bro, yeah, I say that all the time. But that's because that's for the athlete. That's for them staying hype and staying aggressive and trying to make sure. I'm they not gonna dunk the jumps. and be like, see both. Like, yeah, John's not like, actually hype. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no, I mean, if I if I'm trying, if I'm with an athlete in a jump session or I'm in a session where I want them to perform, I'm not gonna like. My goal is just to be a hype man. Sometimes as a coach, that's your whole job is be a hype man. Like. There's, I, there's days where Isaiah goes out in power cleans or squats. I don't have to say anything. Honestly, if I don't say something, that means it's good. That like, if I say something, then you know it's wrong. If I'm saying something, if I'm speaking, if I'm not saying anything about whatever you're doing, assume it's fine. Okay. And I'm just going to hype them up. I'm just going to tell them like push, 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 or rip, grip and rip or whatever it is. Like stop screwing around. That's the sort of stuff that I will say to him because I'm pushing intent. That's my yeah. goal. Uh, and that's the same way with dunking. But I have a bunch of questions about shin splints and stuff like that. Shin splints are like knee pain. It's related to load. If you have shin, there's a bunch of things that can cause shin splints. But at the end of the day, if you have shin splints, you're doing too much for your given foot anatomy, for your given lower leg anatomy, for your given hip anatomy, your body weight, whatever else, your shoes. And that load is so excessive that you're having pain in your shins. Back off whatever you're doing. Come back to it progressively. Change the surface. Find a way to drop the load. Okay, if that means cutting out your warm up and getting on a bike instead or dropping impact, then do that. Um, and then building back into it is the same way. If it causes pain, don't do it. That's generally what I would what I'd recommend for that. Um, oh, an optimal knee angle for the for the knee for one foot jumping. Um, for one foot jumping, you want to touch down almost straight, and then the knee moves into like roughly. Uh, pro I think it's like in high jump, it's about forty degrees of flexion. So like if you land 180 with the leg totally straight, you might move into 140 degrees or like you might flex the knee 40 degrees. So that's not very much. <laughs> yeah. uh, and speed jumpers, and so, it's different for everyone. If you have a more compliant tendon, you'll bend the knee more, but you're up. You got a question you like? Um, what type of ankle exercises do you and John implement to your training? Mm, we do. <clears throat> I mean, you can talk about this, but um, yeah. So, with ankle exercises, one one thing that actually I I think um, helps build ankle strength and like mobility and like helps prevent ankle injuries is deep squats. Um, I know when I'm doing like really good deep squats, the the muscle of my tibialis anterior actually gets like really sore, like tired. Like I feel it working, and it's because like I use it to like, pull me deeper into the bottom. For stabilize, um, yeah. You have co-contraction yeah. happening, and then also like when you're in a deep squat, like 
your art, like the arches in your feet are like working really hard. Your feet are like help, helping you like balance. Um, and that's a lot of load too. Your it's ankle, like a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah, ankle mobility, like it's going up when you're when you're doing that. And it's not like regular, like like doing like ankle circles. Like John said, it's loaded. Like mm-hmm. you're you're in the deep squat, really loaded. So I feel like deep squats help my ankles out a lot. Um, I feel like all the training that we do is like it's inherently rebuil- uh, re- rehabilitative yeah and like everything we the do warm-up. is preventative yeah everything is one of the best things in my opinion for for the yeah 100 percent. if you if you do the full warm-up you add volume you add low level plyo contacts you add uh a cardiorespiratory you check that box for cardiorespiratory endurance but it's it's in a specific way you address coordination you address mobility like the warm up if you do a good warm up you address so many elements of just being an athlete like knowing how to move knowing what what mobility restrictions you have yeah. and if you're a coach and you know jack shit about anything and you watch someone do a warm up and and you can identify things that's really what will take you yeah. to another level as a coach if you're and if you're listening to this it's funny cuz i'm notorious for like rolling my ankle um but and it's because, like, like, I've started to notice this. I have really bad control of, like, my lower leg. Like, in, ter- right. like, like in terms of knowing where my foot is in relation to the ground, like, I'll literally be walking and, like, I'll step, like, like just I'll literally step on the outside of my foot for no reason. Yeah. And, like... His proprioception yeah. is, like, zero. And when he sprints, it's really bad, too. Like, yeah. So even when he sprints and he's thinking about it, he having, still has no control. Yeah. <laughs> having said that, my ankles are actually pretty strong for, for, like, I'll literally... My ankle, I'll step, my ankle will go, like... <laughs> And then, but like, I'll be good. Like it, like it didn't freaking get like injured. Whereas like somebody else that could like, like fuck them up pretty bad. And then also the times I've sprained it really bad. It's literally like freak stuff. That, like, like, uh, Australia, I jumped from, I was 40 inches in the air and I landed on a ball the year before that. I jumped as high as I could have blocked someone, head at rim, and then landed straight on someone's foot. Like, like those are like, like scenarios where I like sprain my ankle really bad um so yeah the training the training we do just inherently makes your feet a lot stronger yeah um, and like the ankle area so yeah and then if i get hurt there's a lot of rehab stuff that we do for that but um that's more for like personal coaching like we, we can help you out through that if that's actually an issue you're having with the here's a good question with the right training slash time is it possible for anyone to achieve a 36 38 40 or 40 plus i think it is but you might not do it the way that you want if you're trying to be like for example a, one, a speed jumper, a one foot speed jumper, getting him to a 40 plus inch vertical. Okay. Not everyone can do that. No way. But most everyone can increase their approach two foot to around at least, at least 36 plus everyone I think should be able to get their approach vertical to 36 plus. I think like you start getting to 40 plus you really got to be diligent. Like you have to do everything perfectly. I mean, there are people out there with crap genetics that still get it done you know and i think like that's a testament to that but if you had the perfect perfect storm i think like most anyone could get their vertical to 40 plus like i mean this is gonna sound bad but like travis is not a genetic freak but he jumps he jumps as high as me like travis has the same vertical that i do at 17 like why does that why is that the case well travis picked two foot jumping travis has been jumping his entire life travis has been obsessed with jumping his entire life Travis has is had a really good background uh, of of a lot of jump volume, and now Travis is getting good training. So Travis's ceiling is a lot higher than what it would have been had he not done all of those things, right? For me, I d- I'm I'm good at like the stuff that I did as a little kid because I didn't know that if you want to get better at dunking, you had to dunk. You know, I, I'm good at uh, plyos. I'm good at long sprints. I'm good at te- like tempo. I'm good at that stuff because that's what I did as a kid. I did that a lot more than I dunked a lot more than I dunked. And I'm better than a lot of dunkers at those things. Cause that's what I did all the time. Um, so yeah, I think like it's, it's possible to, I will say this, it's possible to be a lot better than you probably think that that's the one thing I will say. People generally assume they can't be as good as they actually can be because they're not willing to stick to something for as long as it would take to get really good at jumping. Like, and that applies to anything. If you're, if you work on something a lot, like you really work on it a lot, you will probably succeed at it. Like if if you put in as much time as we have into our craft, like I think that's generally true for anything. If you're, if you're really work super hard, because I don't think I'm I'm not super genetically gifted. I was not a smart kid growing up at all. Um, I just have really good mentors and really good people in my life that help me be successful. So yeah, 
Um, there's kind of the last question I have. I looked through all of them. The rest are kind of like dumb questions. Yeah, I have so many good questions. Um, <laughs> how do I push <laughs> through stunts in my uh, stunts and progress of my vert? Get a coach. Yeah, get a coach. Um, but some general things. Have you, are you getting stronger? Are you getting faster? Are you having variety in your training? Is your is your training crappy? Like I mean, honestly, yeah. like that's what that's what the answer I would almost say is like if your you're stunt if 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 your progress is stunted, you're probably doing like the same thing. Like you can't you can't keep doing the same things and expect different results. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of kind of really basic view into it, but I feel like it's a it's an insight that a lot of you guys need. I have so many good questions, bro. I don't know how many of these. I can just rapid fire try to answer them. All right. <laughs> high rep and low rep intensity plyos for joints and health. They're both relevant. Higher intensity, you got to drop the volume. How to stiffen tendons. We see it happen. Well, there's you can stiffen tendons a lot of ways. We see weight room can stiffen tendons. We see plyos can stiffen tendons. Generally speaking, plyos are going to be the best way to get your output higher. So even if your tendon is stiffer, you might not have the output you want. So plyos are going to be a way to do that. Has Isaiah ever considered dunking more with his left hand as he jumps left right? Yes, he can dunk with his left hand a lot. He actually is going to test the vertex with his left hand. He'll probably, hopefully, touch higher because with his left hand. I did. If you look up, um, this is going to sound like shit. But <laughs> yeah. whistle sport. If you look up Isaiah Rivera, best dunker in the world on YouTube, I literally did a whole session on my left. Because my right hand was injured, so I did a whole session on my left. Dude, Jake Duvaz, I think he's one of our eyes. Does he work with us right now? He, he, you've asked so. so many questions, bro. I'm going to skip your questions. <laughs> College, collagen vitamin C hour before workout is worth it. Okay. So Isaiah Permula, per, Perumala is asking this. Um, a lot of people have been talking about the collagen vitamin D thing. This is what I will say. There is no concrete evidence. Okay. That says in a, in a applied sense. Okay. In the sense of outside of basic science, there is no clinical recommendation that says you should do that. However, there is promising basic science, i.e. A, a cell in a Petri dish. A cell in a Petri dish to a human being is a massive jump. That is why partially we're testing a vaccine for a year after it exists, okay? Because yeah, you killed the virus in a Petri dish, but the human body is like infinitely more complex than that. So don't uh, keep that in mind that Keith Barr is not a clinician. He's not, he is a scientist. So his recommendations that he's giving, honestly, in my opinion, I don't know if anyone listens to this, people worship Keith Barr. They really do. And it actually pisses me off because he is a fucking basic scientist. He's in a lab. He doesn't work with athletes. All right. And there is value in that. Don't get me wrong. But to throw everything out and say that, oh, he's a clinician and, and his advice is clinical in a sense, like it like to me is, is a big, big, big jump, right? There's a lot of degrees of separation from a Petri dish to a human being. So is it worth trying? Yeah. If you don't mind taking in collagen and vitamin C every day, yeah, go for it. But if you don't want to drink disgusting chalk flavored water and, and mixed with vitamin C, do that six hours every day, then don't do it. Another thing, keep from experience, keep bar recommended doing a plyometric session every six hours, right? For your tendons. If I did that and I have tried it, like jump rope, my tendons will explode. Literally, I will be in so much pain. I cannot physically handle doing that. And I am a very bouncy, elastic athlete. So, I mean, it's it's good in theory. We don't know yet. Now, if he's, we got to wait for that research to catch up and say, yes, this is something that you should be doing. But try, from experience <laughs> in trying it, hell no, I would not do some of the recommendations that, that he has previously uh, advised. I think what he's saying is interesting. I think what he's saying about the basic science about tenons is very insightful. But again, big stretch when you do that. So that's my personal Bro, advice. I'm about to die of hunger. Isaiah's going to go to Wendy's. <laughs> He's going to go to Wendy's. Isaiah can't handle that anymore. I got to edit these. I'm going to do two, three more as fast as possible. All right. All right. How to develop speed on the first step. Practice the first step. What is the function of the toe dragging at the start of a sprint? Uh, it's supposed to in decrease flight time in the first phase and increase contact time, which is going to help you project down the track and it can increase the direction of your sh it can change the direction of your shin angle which can help you project i didn't better. know that toe drag was used uh in a positive way uh, uh i mean it's it's generally not advised to do but it can't it's a cue that you can use to get people and it will help you achieve those things but yeah. dragging your toe actually dragging your i would say keep your foot oh, so it's something drag. it's like a cue like yeah. something like well some people actually drag their toe actually dragging your toe is friction and it's just maybe for you a mental cue like oh this ensures that i do this thing correctly yeah. but um, it's cause benefit. Yeah, of, like I, I've seen the fast, like Andre DeGrasse never dragged his toe and he ran super fast. 
you say all the Jamaicans do it because Glenn Mills coaches them to. Uh, but otherwise, I don't think it's worth it. DC takeoff, how can you tell when someone should end a strength phase if you stop getting stronger? You should end a strength phase after like three or four weeks because that's the amount of time that you can... Oh man, this is a big question. You adapt most to a session after like, most to a stimulus after like two or three contacts with that like stimulus and then progressively it starts to get less and less effective. Two weeks? No, I'm saying like two or three stimuli, you see it. Like if you see a stimulus two or three times, oh, okay, you, that's gotcha. the max amount you're going to adapt to it and then you need variety to spur on more adaptation, usually. That's a big, big generalization. There's a lot more to that. All right, that's it. I'm cutting it. Isaiah can't handle this anymore. i got to clip this up. It's going to take forever. Uh, uh, we're going to do that later. Peace out, guys. Isaiah needs Wendy's. i got to train. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, make sure you like, subscribe, go to the YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Go to his channel. Subscribe. Uh, if you're looking for trade. If you're looking for training, thpstrength.com. Um, sign up for coaching there. We will get you right. We believe in our product because it works. and It's the best. I, I, I would put me in a room with anyone else and we'll debate and we'll see who wins. Yeah, I'll be there to moderate. <laughs> people say that all the time. Like, I say that all the time. Way. Yeah, people say that. Like I say that all the time and like all the other coaches get pissed, but like I don't care. Uh, At this point, it doesn't matter. It, doesn't, like, it doesn't matter, dude. I, I've learned you can't have friends. I'll jump you. You can't have friends. In the I'll industry. jump you. All right, peace out. <laughs>